Hello, and thank you so much for joining us. My name is Ashley Craven, and I am the Marketing Director of Griffin House. And today I am joined by two lovely ladies, Nancy Serbrook, Serbrook Goins and Sarah Nichols. And Nancy and Sarah are both co-authors of the recently published book called Go Growing Together, Developing and Sustaining a Community of Practice in Early Childhood. So hello, Nancy. Hello, Sarah. Thank you so much for joining us. Hello. Hi, thanks for having us. And so, you know, typically we would say how important communities of practice are, you know, making sure that that both, you know, not only educators, but administrators and anyone really in the education professional profession, that they are looped into this constant conversation and constant connection with their peers or supervisors or their community. And so normally we would say that's incredibly important. But now, on top of everything, on top of the world changing, on top of COVID-19, I would say that it is more than ever more important right now. Um, and so with that being said, you know, can, can you expand on that? Why are communities of practice so incredibly important always? But in particular, why are they so important right now? I'll, uh, I'll go first, Nancy, if that's OK. Um, so I think, um, I mean, I agree, community practice are always super important. We found a lot of value with them over the years. Uh, but you know, right now, things are changing so rapidly, new information's coming out rapidly, administrators and um, organizational leaders are trying to figure out what to do next, how to do it best, um, also trying to learn about what other people are doing. So um, really thinking about um, how, how to work um, smarter, safer, <laughs> without making things any harder than they already are. And so um, I think the opportunity to connect with people who are, um, whether they're in the same role, in the same district, in the same program um, that you're in, um, or, or, or maybe um, working in a different district or a different organization, but maybe problem solving and troubleshooting some of the same things, um, having the time to come together and share those concerns, um, listen to each other, share lessons learned, um, is just super important. And I think the other piece right now, I think a lot of people are feeling super um, isolated, um, not being in their same in-person opportunities to network with people in the same way. Um, and so I think um, communities of practice have the opportunity to help people overcome a little bit of that maybe feeling of isolation as well as problem solve with one another about how to um, how to work through some of these things that are just really incredibly um, new and different and challenging at times. And so I'll just add on to a little bit to that if that's okay Ashley and Sarah and in our book we talk um, a lot about the importance of communities of practice in the first chapter and really how communities of practice have always been a part of our society and culture. And I think now, as Sarah has said, it does become so much more important about and just sharing where you're at, because there's so many times that um, I will be under, and this is just a personal example, I'll be under a lot of stress and not thinking that I have other people that might be under the same stress and dealing with some of the same problems. But when I go to my community practice and I share, you know, what is going on in my life, others start to share as well. And then we can problem solve together as far as what might work in my profession or what might work uh, with my particular issue might also work for somebody else and some of those key pieces. Um, and it just seems to be a really great way to get some answers quickly when um, there's so much, there's so much information out there. How do we sift through and find what we need right away? And I find that uh, community practice is helpful in that area as well. Right, and I, I would venture to guess too that it's not only that you're finding good advice quickly or even easily, but it's almost as though you've vetted those who you're asking for advice. You know, you created this community of practice knowing that, you know, you've vetted them. You know that these are people that you, whose opinion you trust and whose recommendations you know um, that you believe in. So I, I, I feel that, you know, if you want something quick and easy, maybe you would just Google it but that doesn't necessarily mean that's quality. And so with this community of practice, I like how you said, you have the opportunity to, it, it is quick and at your fingertips because you know exactly who to call. 
um, or you have your, your regular group meetings, whether they're virtual right now or in person with masks or what have you. But, I, you know, thank you for sharing that. I think that's great. So, you know, I think along those same lines, as with COVID-19 and frankly, back to school in general, um, knowing that back to school looks very different for different people across the country and, and the world at that, you know, how can communities of practice really help with, you know, educators and practitioners and leaders, how can it help share this or even help resolve the burdens and stressors of, of COVID-19? You can come and share your problems, but you also can share solutions and ask other people what they've already done. So you're not, um, as we call it, reinventing the wheel or you're not recreating things that are already created. So that you aren't starting from ground zero, you can, you always have somewhere to go where someone has started something to build on. And that has been helpful, I know, um, in a number of different communities of practice, especially when we're looking at return to school plans and different things like that, where, where we come together and say, okay, who has started it? Who has you know, started to formulate what their back to school plan might look like and how can we build on that? Um, communities of practice have been very helpful in those areas during this time. Um, it, even in non-COVID times, it's helpful to share those resources. But right now, when decisions are being made so quickly and so fast, and the, the resources needed to help make those decisions seem to be abundant from a number of different resources, it's nice to have someone who started the process share with you what they have and then build upon it, create a better document for and policies and procedures for everyone. Yeah, I would add to that. I agree with everything that Nancy said. And I would add to that. One of the things that I'm finding during this time is that um, there's been a rapid development of resources co-developed across community members. So um, there's that piece of that sharing. Sometimes you just need to kind of pick and you know choose what you can garnish from the community and then adapt it for your own unique needs. Um, but then sometimes something new has come out and everybody has the same need. So you can spend some time in a subgroup or a work group within the community and co-develop. So we've had some really interesting opportunities in some of the communities of practice that I facilitate where we've had rapid development of checklists and worksheets and we've been you know, all kind of bringing in the information that we have from our, our sources or our organizations and then uh, co-developing things together, and then the production happens a lot faster. The tools get out to the fields, the educators, the practitioners faster. And so um, it's kind of been a divide and conquer of how we're sharing our resources in some capacity. So that's been really nice. And I think that, you know, when I think about the book, one of the things we were really hoping with the book was through all of our experiences, that we would provide some tools for, for our readers so that they didn't have to reinvent the wheel and figure out, okay, so maybe I don't know of a community of practice or there isn't one that exists, but I, I've been searching for this and there's gotta be somebody else out there that's struggling with the same thing. So the book gives some, some tools and some reflective questions to help you think about um, if, if what you're looking for doesn't exist already out there, how might you get started? Um, and really thinking about um, finding those people with your shared interests and how you can work together. Um, and you know, the unique thing about communities of practice is because they're super informal, they don't have to be a formal structure. And we talk about that um, as well. And so it's like the, um, the opportunity to come together when there's a high need, um, there's the flexibility to come together as often as you need to um, and maybe increase your intensity right now. Um, and if you've, meet, if you've met all of your objectives as a community and you don't need each other so much as we move through this, that fluidity can change. The flexibility, you know, the community can be flexible with that. So um, I really see a lot of need right now during these unusual times and circumstances for folks to find their outlets of supports and whether they're already involved in them or they exist or they need to think about where do I go to get the information besides Google <laughs> um, when you know you need some trusted practitioners or educators or administrators to soundboard your ideas and your concerns and um, your shared practices moving forward. Um, a community of practice can be a super tool. I think so much of what you shared too, uh, Sarah, reminds me of, you know, just being so scrappy and entrepreneurial and efficient with 
your time and your resources. What I hear you saying is if you haven't already figured out the, you know, found your own solution, then, you know, use your resources to, to see how other people have solved this exact same problem. Don't, don't waste time reinventing the wheel on your own. There are people who are in your community that, you know, have already done all of that. So I think that's really helpful to remember. And, you know, as you speak of your community and as you speak of the ease of meeting, I know we did a, a webinar um, at some point, or maybe I'm, I'm thinking back to a specific page in your, in your book, but I know that you talk about using virtual community, a, a virtual um, connection really to create your community of practice. And I guess I have a twofold question. One is how close knit, uh, close in proximity, geographic proximity, does your community of practice need to be or should be? And building off of that, how effective is a virtual community of practice as opposed to in person? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because Nancy and I might be able to speak um, to, to some different perspectives on this because ironically, I all of the communities of practice that I facilitate are virtual and always have been. Um, you know, I actually, um, I work for the University of Illinois, but I, I work remotely and I live in Florida. And I've lived in Florida for 10 years now, going on uh, 11. And one of the first communities of practice that I helped co-found started when I first moved away. And I had to figure out how do I stay connected with my peers and my colleagues in Illinois when I am, you know, so many, you know, states away <laughs> from everybody. Um, and so uh, it's it's been interesting. It's been a, a, a great journey as technology has changed and evolved. It's gotten a whole lot easier than it was 10 years ago. Um, so there's certainly some things to consider when you're considering a virtual platform. And we talk about a few of those things in the book too. So just some of the things that you need to think about if you're connecting virtually as compared to in person um, or face-to-face, -face, however you wanna refer to, to the different types of connectivity and engagement that people choose to use. But um, I do absolutely 100% believe that virtual uh, communities of practice can be just as effective and successful. Um, one of the things when you asked about proximity, you know, one of the communities of practice that I facilitate is, is nationwide. And so um, we have people in all different time zones and we all share a role. So we all have, wear a similar hat in the field. Um, so what's, what's important is that we share an interest. We share in um, ideas around the same things, problem solving with one another. Um, that's really the driving force of what the community is. And then all the other tools and components and pieces that make it successful are things that, that really are necessary for any type of um, group to come together and stay together. So, um, you know, effective communication, being highly organized. Um, we, I think it's chapter four talks about facilitation skills. And so, you know, obviously all the different things that you need to consider, regardless of an in-person or virtual, um, really apply uh, when it comes to that, um, you know, keep communicating effectively with the community and being organized. But the other piece too is the engagement. And so I think during um, COVID-19, people have been forced to have a, a rapid crash course in the use of technology in different ways. And so um, making sure that in, anytime you're connecting virtually that everybody that's participating knows how to use the technology and you're choosing technologies that are gonna be effective for your purposes and that everybody can gain access equally. Um, and so those are things that there's definitely extra considerations um, when it comes to connectivity uh, virtually, but absolutely, I think they can be effective. And um, I'll let Nancy kind of share, because she's, she's got experience with both um, virtual as well as in-person communities of practice. Yes, thank you, Sarah. Actually, we um, started our communities of practice in Michigan for the early on, which is our early intervention program, um, as a face-to-face -face offering. And this, just during COVID, we've migrated that to a virtual offering. And some of the things that Sarah was talking about, we, I can totally relate to is um, people really enjoy getting together and they enjoy sharing um, their frustrations and successes and challenges and, and everything that's going on face-to-face -face and brainstorming ideas and, and seeing how they can solve things. And then we, as, as happened with the rest of the world, COVID hit, and then we decided 
um, our next round of community practice were in May. And then just looking at how do you offer a community of practice that is used to being held face to face in our virtual world and still have the same integrity and the same um, um, camaraderie that you would see in a face to face. And it does take time and effort. It takes a little bit more facilitation from um, our facilitators and comfort with the platform that they're using. So um, learning that the Zoom platform and becoming comfortable with it and encouraging people to share and having them feel comfortable with the camera on or off and muting when they're not talking and all of that stuff are all pieces that we had to work through in keeping with the spirit of a community of practice and that informal um, atmosphere that we try to, to have at the in-person. So that has been a challenge for us as um, we're now on our second round of um, virtual communities of practice. And we offer one every three months and just moving away from that face-to-face -face since that isn't something right now that we're doing much in Michigan and uh, offering it in a virtual way in an effective um, manner. And I've noticed it takes just like with anything else that we've moved to virtual, it takes some time for people to get used to the fl platform as well as participation in a virtual world. Um, I think people that don't like talking in front of others um, feel even more shy in a camera situation where they're always on film and they would prefer to be in a smaller group and participate that way or not at all, depending on, you know, um, their, what, what else they've had to deal with that day or other things. So that is another consideration when we're doing a community of practice is how involved and how interactive can your group be. I had a question in mind and I feel like you've already covered quite a, a, a bit of that, but I'm going to ask it just in case, Sarah, if you have any other points to add. And of course, Nancy, if you have uh, any additional points to comment on. But my, my follow-up question to that, um, it sounds like you, you did share some tips into how to really make virtual communities of practice work right now. And going back to the, you know, I want to call it like operational or housekeeping um, at, the, at the top where it's, you know, common courtesy, mute if you're not speaking, so on and so forth. And, you know, trying to find ways to engage people that might be afraid, or maybe not afraid, but not as inclined to speak, especially on camera. So. Um, I'll, I'll direct the first part of this question to you, Sarah, is, you know, what are some tips that you can provide your colleagues to creating their own community of practice right now, particularly in the midst of COVID-19? Yeah, well, I mean, I think it always comes back to, to the shared interest piece, you know, I mean, thinking about um, kind of where, where you're struggling, where you're seeking for information and support, and um, what your interests are, and um, who can, you know, kind of reach out or who you can reach out to, to, to kind of support you in accomplishing those things. And sometimes it's people who are, um, like you in your role and your knowledge and expertise. And sometimes it's people who, um, maybe have different levels of knowledge and expertise from different fields. I find that it's so, it's actually quite interesting because, um, I'm actually looking to resources outside of, early childhood intervention and, and early childhood education to better understand how to support people um, with distance learning, right? And so sometimes if our field um, doesn't always have all of the knowledge and expertise that we need right now, it's about thinking about what you're good at, where your gaps are, and then where do you need to go? Um, and sometimes it's outside of your circles um, and bringing those other folks in um, to maybe share some resources from outside the field and expertise, subject matter experts. And so I think right now, I think, um, you know, when we think about kind of that, that creating, um, I think it's starting with thinking about their shared interests. And we do have some reflective questions to kind of help you think about that in the book. But I think it's, it goes back to those shared interests and then kind of who within your field or within your role or within your organization can help you problem solve. And then where else do you need to go to, to get the information that you need? Um, when it comes to speaking to the, the very specific, if you're, if you're wanting to follow up on virtual tips, um, more specifically, I think um, considering what your objective of your community is as far as the types of things you want to discuss or do. And so for some that may require a platform like Zoom to, to interact, um, maybe 
maybe the free platform works for you, or maybe you want to look into um, other other tools and resources that may be provided or available for you through your organization. Um, lots of people like Google Hangouts or what, I mean, I think it, I don't know if they're changing names because Google's constantly coming up with new things, but, um, but like sometimes communities of practice, even if you're not meeting, um, you know, at a synchronous time, like we are right now, there's asynchronous activities that can and could happen virtually. Maybe it's working together um, within, um, you know, a Google Doc or another, another form and sharing back and forth. And so I think the engagement piece, right now we're finding that, uh, I would say the communities and practice that I facilitate are, are better, more um, well attended um, meetings right now than they have been, um, just because people are not trying to work around travel schedule as much and their home. And yes, they're sometimes working around their own family lives and schedules um, and, and their, their coworkers, <laughs> their two-legged and four-legged coworkers that are in the home um, and those types of challenges. Um, but people are, are eager and hungry to connect with other people. And so um, there's a, a, some flexibility that people are finding to, to find an hour here or an hour there to connect. And so sometimes that's happening synchronously through some of these tools. Um, that we talked about, but sometimes um, having the opportunity and the flexibility for people to engage um, in other ways in between meetings or in between um, those synchronous activities is really important because for the people who can't get there but really need the information or want the information to have an opportunity to participate um, and connect and network with community members um, in another virtual way. Um, can really be important. And I think um, one other thing that I just, I know I'm going on probably too long, but I think is so important right now is, um, you know, it's really, it's really hard sometimes as a facilitator to stay positive and keep the energy positive and productive within a community of practice. And I think one of the things um, that I have found super helpful in the communities that I lead, as well as in the communities that I am an active participant in, is to have a point of reflection and give people that time and space to take the breath, um, to, to have a, um, a chance to, to maybe reflect on something that might be their highest priority um, of the day. And whether that's personally or professionally, having some sort of a reflective activity to give people kind of permission to acknowledge um, what's going well and or what's really hard. Um, for them in that moment in time. And I think sometimes giving that time and space um, at, up front within your, uh, within your meeting uh, is uh, important for cultivating the relationship and allowing people to, to be who they are, where they are. Because, uh, you know, some people, depending on the day, uh, they're really active and ready and ready to engage. And other times they just need to be a little bit quiet and listen because of, um, the ongoing changes of, of the world and life and their profession that they're navigating. Yeah, well, thank you so much for sharing, Sarah. That was, that's fantastic. I think um, all of your points are so salient. And I think one of the things that really sticks out to me is that people crave connection and, um, and you'll find a way to connect to colleagues or um, to those who you admire in your field. Um, so I think communities of practice are one of those opportunities for just, you know, enhancing connection. Um, so thank you both. Thank you so much, Nancy. Thank you so much, Sarah, for joining us today, uh, for talking about the importance of communities of practice and uh, what they mean and also their you know, incredible importance right now during COVID-19 um, and during this back to school time. So thank you both so much for joining us. Um, to our audience, thank you for joining us. Do go ahead to griffinhouse.com and take a look at their book called Growing Together uh, right on the homepage. There it is. Thank yes. you, Nancy. <laughs> nice little Vanna White. Um, do go ahead uh, at griffinhouse.com right on the homepage. You will find it uh, just published this year. So thank you so much uh, again, Nancy and Sarah and have a great day.